Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Kozak. I'm a proud UBC alumnus and Dean of the Faculty of Forestry. I'm delighted to be your host for our virtual program this afternoon entitled Our Losing Battle with Nature, Transition or Destiny. As we all know, climate change has elevated the risk of extreme weather events all over the, the world. And today we'll be concentrating on, on one such event, uh, flooding, and specifically the influence that the forests and the practice of forestry can have in mitigating flood risks. And to help guide us through this complex and dynamic and very timely topic, we're delighted to have one of the world's foremost experts in, in forest hydrology here with us today, um, our very own Dr. Yunus Alila. Before we begin, I, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that UBC's Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and that UBC Okanagan is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Sayalx Okanagan Nation. For millennia, these sites have been places of learning where cultures, histories, and traditions are passed on from one generation to the next. And it's very much in that spirit that we're, we're gathered here today. I'd also like to recognize that many of you are joining us from, from many places near and far, and I would encourage you to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. By doing so, we're reminded that Canada's legacy of colonization continues into the present, and that all of us have an obligation to advance decolonization in this country. So on behalf of the Faculty of Forestry, I would like to extend a, a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us today and, and thank you in advance for helping to create a respectful and inclusive environment for all of our speakers and audience members. Just a tiny bit of housekeeping before we begin, um, and I pass the mic on to our moderator. If anyone is experiencing any audio or video issues whatsoever, please just reach out via the chat feature in, in Zoom for assistance and, and we'll try to get on it right away. So that brings us to the event. And at this point, I'm excited to turn the floor over and introduce you to our moderator for today's event, Dr. Lori Daniels. Uh, many of you know Lori. Lori Daniels is a professor of forest ecology with the UBC Faculty of Forestry. She directs the Tree Ring Lab where her research team reconstructs historical fire regimes as well as the impacts of climate change and other human related activities on forests. Uh, with their research team, Lori is investigating wildfires and forest resilience to climate change in a number of localities, the interior of BC, uh, national parks in the Rocky Mountains and in the foothills of Alberta. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Lori. Uh, the screen is now yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, I am so happy to be here and to lead this conversation with my fellow UBC faculty member, Dr. Yunus Alila. During the second half of today's webinar, um, we'll have opportunities for members of the audience to ask questions. So to answer, or ask questions of the speaker, we're using um, the, the program or the app Slido. And so our audience, um, to engage with the audience members. So just as a reminder, your email that you received about the webinar included instructions on how to use Slido. And for those of you who have already input some questions, thank you very much. As we go, please feel free to add questions um, and to vote for your favorite questions. To do so, you can go to slido.com and you'll see an icon where it says, you know, um, enter your event code and you can type in their flood risk to sign in. And there are additional ins instructions on the screen um, with a link that's now in the chat as well. So welcome everyone. The starting point for today's discussion is that climate change has elevated the risk of extreme weather events the, all around the world. In British Columbia, a natural flood risk um, mitigator lies all around us in the water absorbing power of trees. In fact, research has shown that even a modest loss of forest due to changes um, resulting from wildfire, from logging, from forest insects or disease can cause a surprisingly large increase in the frequency of extreme floods. Will dikes, dams, levees, other infrastructure be enough to protect us and our property from devastation and loss due to floods in the future? How can nature-based solutions such as forests 
and the restoration of natural floodplains and wetlands contribute to flood mitigation. What conservation or considerations need to be taken as BC develops its flood risk management strategy? It is now my pleasure to introduce our featured um, speaker, Professor Eunice Alila, who will be addressing these questions. Eunice is a professor of forest hydrology and watershed management within our faculty, the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. Eunice's research program is designed to provide scientifically based information, knowledge and expert advice that promotes sound policies, solves urgent operational problems and provides a solid foundation on which to build sustainable forest and water resources management in British Columbia. Welcome Eunice. I will now be passing the slide or the screen over to Eunice um, for his prepared presentation. So during this time for our audience members, remember to submit your questions via Slido so that we can see your questions um, that you have about this topic, that you can vote for questions that are of interest to you, and, um, and to follow up with a rich conversation once Eunice has, has presented. So please, again, use slido.com and the event code flood risk. And now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Eunice. In recent years, BC has, ex has been experiencing some of the most severe atmospheric rivers, floods, droughts, landslides, and wildfire. For example, floods and landslides over the entire Caribou region have been in the news since the late 90s. The 2018 flood events, flood event damaged in Grand Fork, damaged over 400 homes and many farms and businesses. The 2021 Pacific Northwest flood caused damage estimated in the billions of dollars, making it the costliest flood disaster in the history of BC. The town of Cash Creek made headline news again in 2023 as a result of flooding. The 2018 muddy flume of a spring ran off into the Okanagan Lake, traced back to logging practices in the peachland watershed. Common to many of these cases is what appears to be a pattern, namely the same towns are being on either flood watch warning or advisory on a regular basis. In recent years, global warming has been quick to blame, especially by government agencies for the calamities caused by these extremes. However, there are other equally important causes exacerbating the risk of extreme. Some of these are, some, some of these other causes are the continually changing land use, such as urbanization, agricultural practices, mining, etc. Continually changing forest cover by clear cut logging, beetle infestation, and wildfires. And of course, the outdated flood management policy that relies heavily, if not exclusively, on infrastructures such as dikes, bridges, and culverts. These engineering solutions provide a false sense of security for two reasons. Higher dikes and bigger bridges will not solve the problem because their failure may not be caused by floods exceeding their design capacity but because of smaller floods becoming more frequent over time, destabilizing these structures. While the former mode of failure is called hydrologic, the latter is referred to as geomorph geomorphic mode of failure. The second problem with the engineering solution to flood risk is that they are really treating the symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. For instance, 
if you have a reoccurring flooding problem in Quinella or Williams Lakes, check what could be increasing the runoff and sediment regimes in the headwaters of the entire Caribou region. If you have a reoccurring flooding in Grimfolk, check what could be increasing the runoff and sediment regimes in the headwaters of the Kettle River Basin. If you have a reoccurring flooding in Cache Creek, and we do, check what could be increasing the runoff and sediment regime in the headwaters of the entire Bonaparte River Basin. BC is draped with dikes, but a 2021 report warned that most of the dikes in BC do not fully meet the provincial standards and likely fail even during a moderate flood. Dikes can also breach as a result of the sediment buildup at the bottom of the river, choking their flow carrying capacities. The fine sediments are generated in the headwaters and end up deposited in the downstream reaches of these rivers. Experts from across disciplines have been calling for a shift from the culture of, quote unquote, engineering our way out of flood risk of the 60s and the 70s into adopting the so-called nature-based solutions to flood management. There is good coverage of the so-called nature-based solutions in the Vancouver Sun Award-winning series of seven parts titled Fire and Floods Facing Two Extremes, which was published in the spring of 2022. I quickly list a few of the suggested solutions here. Number one, restore the natural storage capacity of the floodplain instead of raising the dikes. Restore the wetlands to provide the extra storage of runoff much needed during large events. Foster agricultural practices that coexist with higher waters. I'm all for nature-based solutions, but these suggested solutions are still treating the symptoms. And locally, as opposed to the root cause of the problem of the flood risk, which lies tens, hundreds, and even thousands of kilometers upstream of the highly populated areas. Both history lessons and up-to-date science are pointing out that any flood management strategy, if not designed to address the root cause of the problem, will not meet its objectives. But why nature-based solution is the only way forward? The answer to such question hinges heavily on a sound understanding of the environmental controls of floods, especially under pristine conditions in BC. One might ask, what's the point in understanding the controls of floods under pristine conditions? One might, right? The answer to that is, we are controlled by nature, but by discovering causes, we can recover some of the controls. Historically, and until several decades ago, BC has been blessed with the climate and landscape features that work in harmony to mitigate floods. A big portion of precipitation of a BC fall in the form of snow accumulating on the ground from mid-October to end March to end of March every year. But that accumulated the snow takes months to melt. The sea is mountainous, and mountains desynchronize the melt from different elevations and slope orientations caused by contrasting amount of solar energy. The sea is also draped with lakes, wetlands, and flat plains, which provide storage for that excess runoff much needed during large events. Entire channel network, especially the downstream floodplains of rivers, are Mother Nature way of providing extra storage for runoff during these large events. 
Soil is the mother of all storage facilities in the landscape where precipitation and melt have a chance to infiltrate travel and the travel long distances below the ground before finding its ways to the channel network. Last but not least, diverse old and second growth forest cover intercept precipitation and pumps out moisture from the soil via process hydrologists call evapotranspiration and creating that extra soil storage much needed during large event. But the forest also shade the snowpack to further slow down the melt and allow it to slowly recharge groundwater, much needed in the channel during the driest period of the year. Mes amis, this explanation that I just walked you through on the role of each of these climate and landscape features can play in mitigating the severity of floods in BC, although true, is actually incomplete and can potentially be highly misleading. Since we never know when the next flood is going to hit, or how severe it is going to be, the, the cause effect relations between floods and their environmental control under undisturbed and disturbed conditions can only be investigated within a probabilistic framework, unfortunately. The relation between the magnitude and probability of floods is called the flood frequency distribution or flood frequency curve for short. The flood frequency curve is characterized by the long-term mean annual floods. The variability around that mean over time and a third parameter called the skew, which is a measure of the extent to which the curve deviates from the bell-shaped curve. An increase in the mean, as you could see from the lower panels, shifts the curve up. An increase in the variability steepens the curve while a skew affects the curvature to become either concave or convex. Therefore, the only way to isolate the effect of any disturbance on floods is to compare two flood frequency curves with and without the disturbance. Disturbances can increase the mean, variability, and the skew of the flood frequency distribution, hence increasing the likelihood of extremes. That is the shaded area under the upper tail. Extreme floods can be highly sensitive to even small changes in the mean variability and the skew of the frequency distribution. This framework of investigating the effect of disturbances on extremes using the probability distribution is well established since the 80s across disciplines, especially in climate change science and the wider hydrology. Over the last 20 years, however, it has been further developed to evaluate the extent to which a specific extreme event is caused, say, by global warming or land use changes. It is now referred to as attribution science. Attribution science and its development over the last 20 years is driven by the needs of policymakers, insurance companies, and lawyers who are asking how much of a flood event is attributable to logging, global warming, wildfire, etc. The wider literature tells us that flood frequency curves could manifest as either concave down like on the right panel, or concave down and milder and slope, like on the left, the right panel, or convex up and steeper and slope, like the left panel. There is a lot of support in the literature for the hypothesis that under pristine condition, natural condition, the flood frequency distribution in BC generally concave down and mild and slope. And this is what actually makes the floods in BC to be hypersensitive to disturbances of any kind. Climate change, wildfire, clear-cut logging, urbanization. This is because when the upper tail is concave and milder, the same increase 
and the magnitude of floods caused by disturbance will translate into much larger changes in the frequency or return period. Sometimes we call frequency return period. Unlike the case for convex steeper flood frequency distribution. I'm going to share with you four case studies to illustrate the hypersensitivity of floods, particularly in BC to disturbances. Case one refers to study conducted by colleagues at the PKIC who published a paper applying attribution science to investigate the extent to which global warming contributed to the 2021 flood event in the Southwest BC. I want to share with you my thoughts on some of their findings related to how global warming affect the entire flood frequency distribution, not a specific event. This figure adopted from their publication is shown how the flood level in the cold water river, which used to be experienced once every 100 years, is now experienced once every 23 years. This means the 100 year event is becoming now five times more frequent as a result of global warming. It is the pattern revealed in this figure that is of interest and in my opinion has a huge implications on professional practice related to any flood management strategy. Namely, global warming affects floods of all sizes, the small, the medium, the large, the very large, and the biblical. The larger the flood, the larger the effect is on the magnitude and most importantly on the frequency. There is a pattern in that curve that the higher, the, 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 the larger the size of the flood event, the more frequent it becomes. Such is the nature of the beast of the science of extreme. As professionals, we should be concerned not only about how global warming affects events larger than 50, 100, and 200 years, but also event less than 20 year level. Because these small to medium events, they the one in 10, the one to the one in two to the one in 10 and one in 20 are more responsible for the changes to the sediment regime. And that's critical because an increase in the flood risk in the dike sections of the rivers could be a result of an increase in the sediment deposited in these low lying rivers. My work on floods and that of others support the hypothesis that the forest cover is our best natural protection against an increase in flood risk. There are signs pointing out to the hypothesis that the forest cover is even more powerful or could be more powerful in reducing flood risk than the ability of global warming to increase such a flood risk. Some European countries for that matter already adopted policies of replanting trees for the purpose of mitigating against an increase in flood risk caused by their global warming. This case study published over 20 years ago, believe it or not, illustrate the power of the forest cover in mitigating flood risk in a large watershed, 10,000 square kilometer in the rain environment of the UK. From the figure in front of you, global warming has also shifted up and steepened the flood frequency curve in this 10,000 square kilometer watershed in the rain environment. Global warming changed the 50 year event into a 10 year event that is five, more, five, five times more frequent. The baseline land use land cover, the, the land use and land cover under baseline condition in this particular watershed is a mix of urban agriculture and forest. You could see in the next slide how increasing the forest cover to 50% of the watershed area lowered the flood frequency curve halfway through between the brown and the black curves. You could see as a result that the 20 year flood level is now twice less frequent as a result of the forest cover. But the 50 year flood level is five times less frequent as a result of the forest cover, increasing it to 50% of the watershed area. In other words, 
the larger the event, the more powerful the forest cover is in mitigating against such a flood occurrence. By the way, this trend is expected for events larger than 50 year flood. Okay, study number three, moving on to the snow interior, snow, snow environment of BC interior, where our work showed that the forest cover is actually even way more powerful in mitigating against flood risk than even the rain environment. And in my opinion, I worked so long on this, that it became so obvious that the forest cover is much more powerful in mitigating against flood risk in the snow environment than it is in the rain. This is one of our studies illustrating the effects of clear cut logging in a five square kilometer watershed, part of the UPC experiment in the snow environment. As you can see in there, the 30% cut rate changes the 100 year event into a 15 year event, while the 100% cut rate changes the same 100 year event into a mere two to three year event. An increase in the cut rate not only moves the flood frequency curve up as a result of an increase in its mean, but also makes it much steeper as a result of an increase in the variability of the floods over time around their mean, causing the diversions of the two flood frequency curves at their upper tail. The sensitivity of the floods to clear cut logging in this case is attributed to the predominantly subdued topography in this watershed its east-west dominant aspects and the connectivity of the cut blocks to the stream network in this case. The next case study number four, and this slide shows a figure from a study under review by a journal. It's, it's the third round of revisions. It is out of the master thesis of one of my ex graduate students of mine by the name of Robbie Johnson. Robbie investigated the effect of historic clear cut logging in the Deadman River. He's about 900 square kilometer watershed located 50 kilometer west of the city of Kamloops. And representative of the Thompson Plateau environment. Unlike the 2013 study by Schnorbos and Alila, which I just presented in case three at the UPC experimental watershed for a five square kilometer size watershed, where clear cut logging increased both the mean and variance of floods and the curves became divergent. Only the mean of the floods has increased and by 38% in the Dead Man Cree River case. We hypothesized that the increase in variance in the dead man was inhibited because the watershed is draped to the small lakes and has a highly diverse aspect distribution, both of which mitigate the efficiency with which runoff is delivered to the outlet and hence the severity or magnitude of the floods. And this is why the variability we hypothesize have not increased by the clear cut logging that occurred historically in this watershed. Note how the mildness of the flood frequency curve, the upper tail in particular, but in general, in the dead man is actually a signature of the snow regime or the snow environment and the physical characteristics of the watershed, all of which cause the floods to become way more frequent. As you could see in there, the 50 is becoming an eight, the 20 is becoming a five year, the seven is becoming a three. This reminds me of Justin Atridu when he did the conference press immediately after the 2021 flood event, his first sentence on the podium was, climate change has changed a hundred year event into a five. My response was, tell me about it. Even, even modest increases in the magnitude. By the way, this, this a trend of what happened to the frequency of the 7, 20, and 50 years is a 50 year event. 
in terms of change of frequency is expected to actually be maintained even for larger flood events, larger than the 50 year. Even modest increases in magnitude, what, 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 this, what this shows that even modest increases in magnitude of the larger flood events can translate into surprisingly large increases in the frequency of flood. This is indeed a dictum that has been echoed over and over again for decades, but just outside the forest hydrology literature. To conclude, a flood management strategy can only be effective if it addresses the multiple root causes of an increase in flood risk. That is global warming, land use change, land cover change, etc. A flood management strategy can only be effective if it addresses the root causes of the problem in the headwaters of any basin, tens, hundreds, and even thousands of kilometer upstream of the highly populated areas. The flood management strategy can only be effective if it accounts for the fact that infrastructures are failing, not only hydrologically, but most importantly, geomorphically. Many years ago, I had a personal communication a chat with one of my colleagues in the Ministry of Transportation, and he confessed that most of the situation, the failures are geomorphic of this structure and not hydrologic. I have experienced that when I go out to the, to the wood and travel across the tens of thousands of forest roads in any drainage. The flood management strategy can only be effective if it is designed in sync with all other land use and forest management policies. Short of this, we're gonna be wasting taxpayers' money. And finally, flood man flood man last but not least, flood management strategy can only be effective if it is centralized or at the very least highly, highly coordinated between all levels of governments. Thank you very much. That's the end. Thank you, Yunus, for that um, very, very insightful and thought provoking um, seminar. It's given us, I think, lots to think about. And there are many questions that have been um, posted into the chat. Um, I've been watching them as we go, and several of them are interrelated. So I'm going to see if we can cover um, a few of them, um, kind of connect them up and, and see if you can respond to a few of them right off the bat. So digging into those questions. Um, among the top ranked, is um, the question, what is the most effective short-term action that BC could take to mitigate the risk of flooding and the disturbances that you've described that are associated with fl flooding? So a short-term action we can take in BC. The first action that I would recommend is actually to redesign the FERPA and change the policy of forest management now that I am confident that the forest cover is our best natural protection against flood risk. Therefore, changing the policy of forest management in this province is the number one top priority. And, num and number two would be to, again, move away from the engineering solutions, the strict engineering solutions to the flood risk management. And, may and number three, would be to make sure we realize that the root, the root cause of the downstream flood risk is actually the upstream land use, land cover, and climate change effects on the upstream headwaters. Thank you. And I think that connects into multiple questions um, that people have asked. And I'm going to see if I can kind of pull together again multiple questions um, in a row here. So one um, was how much logging can a watershed take um, before it is affected by floods? So can you give us some ideas about proportions of watersheds that might be disturbed? 
it doesn't take much for the flood risk for the flood risk to increase, as you mentioned in your introduction, Laurie. Uh, you need to move away from the clear cut logging into um, into tree selection, small patch cats, surgical operations. We want to make sure we, whatever we do in the way we log the trees, we do not lose the understory and the younger trees in the process of clear cut logging because it takes 20 to 30 years, even in the first 20 to 20 to 30 years, the hydrologic recovery as a result of the 20 to 30 years is really dismal as a result of the regen 20 to 30 years, particularly in the interior dry snow environment. So it sounds like maybe I can again connect these to a couple of, of questions. Um, so is there a difference in your opinion between when we're logging green forests with live trees and salvage logging forests that have been highly disturbed? Either I'm thinking of the amount of, of salvage logging we've done in recent years associated either with mountain pine beetle um, or fire. Do you see differences between those that we need to take into account? I personally think that the beetle infestations have been used in many situations and in many watershed as an excuse to keep moving with the clear cut logging. And therefore, in cases where the stand is actually a mixed species and mixed age, uh, it will be much wiser in terms of mitigating against the flood risk to actually surgically log the larger trees and leave behind the younger ones, right, for the same strategy. So some partial harvesting or or other techniques is what you're you're recommending. Absolutely. Um, there has been the question about you know it it seems that in in many cases the provincial government's been unwilling to apply a precautionary principle to limit the logging in the context of this disaster mitigation. Um, do, do you feel that uh, there's opportunities for your research to have influence on these policies in British Columbia? Well, um, I do not think uh, that um, managing any resources, but particularly forest resources, could be done outside the framework of the science of extremes. Because it, it is these extremes that the ecosystem and society are experiencing. Right, And therefore, in my opinion, there should be no management outside the guidance using the science of extremes. And frankly, for so many decades in British Columbia, forest management had been guided by the forest hydrology, which is non-causal, right? And as a result, because it, it is non-causal because it's outside the the framework of the, 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 the science of extremes. And as a result, we ended up underestimating a great deal the effect of uh, the logging practices on hydrology in general, right? Um, and therefore, I think it is critically important that the, the new regulation and policy of how we've been managing in the future, the forest must be guided by the science of extreme. And I think this would be applicable to the, to the, to the management of any resources, not just uh, forest. Um, okay, so related to that, then maybe we can think about that regeneration of forests where there have been harvesting or salvage harvesting. And um, if we're planting in, um, when we're replanting, so looking at uh, either plantation, um, and regenerating forests. Can you talk a little bit about how the hydrology changes as those trees are planted and it begins, the forestry begins to, or the forest begins to recover? If we're talking about regen and the clear cuts in the snow interior environment, I keep repeating that in the first 20, the trees, the regrowth or regen 
of the replanted trees, in the first 20, 30 years, the, the hydrologic function functionality of those young trees is dismal. You, the effect is practically close to time t equal to zero, zero immediately after the clear cut logging. Right? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, forest management for decades in British Columbia have been based on the so called hydrologic recovery curves. But these hydrologic recovery curves are designed based on energy and stand level balance at the energy and water balance at the stand level and the power of causation between the floods right and the forest disturbance is not necessarily dictated but what happened at the stand and therefore, we couldn't possibly guide the management based on hydrologic recovery curves that are stand level. The Forest Practices Board of British Columbia have warned over and over again, we need to move from stand level management of the forest into landscape management of the forest. And part of that is the hydrology. Because the hydrology that have guided forest management has been to a large extent stand level. And I'm telling you, you measure the effect of snow accumulation and melt at the stand. Th that is physically meaningful, but the flood, the flood frequency curve at the outlet of a watershed is not dictated necessarily by what happened to the energy and water balance at the tree level and at the stand. It's actually dictated by the physiographic characteristics of the watershed, the extent to which you actually conduct a logging scenario through cut blocks that could actually end up synchronizing the melt. So it sounds to me, so the scale issue becomes so important. So not just focusing on the trees and the stands, but scaling right up to that watershed level. So, so if we're kind of, if we're going to take it up to that scale, let's think again, or think about maybe the cumulative effects framework that's been proposed by the province. How can the solutions that you're proposing, how do they connect with um, the provincials or the province or provinces cumulative effects framework? Can you, can you make the connections between these approaches? We've never done cumulative effects in this province until maybe 2015 or was it 16 where the BC government mandated cumulative effects? Yeah. Cumulative effects studies are now done in house by ecologists and biologists and hydrologists. Mm -hmm. But when you look at what is being done in there, it's really outside the framework of extremes. And um, because of that, that cumulative effect framework is actually non-causal and in the process, I continue to say it underestimates dramatically the effect of cumulative, eff the cumulative effect of downstream of logging the headwaters, All right? Let me tell you something there that I emphasized in my presentation that the mildness of the flood frequency curve is a measure of how super sensitive the floods are to disturbance. Guess what? The larger the watershed, the milder is the flood frequency curve. Why? Because the, 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 because there are more storages available in a large watershed. And therefore, this is why there should be no surprise that the larger the watershed, the milder is the flood frequency curve, which means the larger the watershed, the bigger is the cumulative effect, right? So basically the new science, the science of extremes, which yeah. is maybe new to forest hydrology, at least within this province, right? Is actually um, revealing a drama to a point where you really, really need to 
think many times before actually um, approve a forest development plan for the forest industry. So it sounds to me then that there's opportunities to take this probabilistic framework, the, the, the approach that you're advocating and to integrate it better into um, our approaches and the cumulative effects, true? No doubt, yes, no doubt. I mean, um, the, the, the current framework is GIS based. So that part of it is good, I like it. Yeah. But then the, the hydrology science is really um, is really underestimating. It's by no mean. It's likely um, it's no good. Period. Okay. Um, we have a couple other um, questions. Um, if reforestation is a viable flood mitigator, how do we or manage the potential negative effects of the low flows from increasing evapotranspiration with the young planted trees? Do you think that's one of the factors? So the role of evapotranspiration um, in those early forest stands or young forest stands, is that part of the reason that it takes a long time to grow back trees and to have that mitigating effect once harvesting has taken place? Well, I think it is known since antiquity that younger regen will come a point in time when it, they may actually start conspiring, consuming soil water more than the older forest. So if we're talking about coastal environment, for instance, right? Um, when you um, when you actually when you actually replant, right? In um, the, the research from the state of Oregon have shown that um, when you re, when you replant the young regen of the Douglas fir, etc., on the coast, start actually consuming more, 50% more than the older forest that was in there. So that's, um, their soil condition is different than ours. They have a very deep seated soil. Our soil on the coast is much more shallower as a result of the difference in the geologic histories, glaciation versus uh, uh, volcanoes, right? And therefore there's more research that needs to be done to actually address that issue. Fantastic. And I think in answering that question, you've also addressed some of the questions that have come forward asking about the difference in um, regenerating forests versus old forests, for example. Um, we have time for just one more question. And so I'm looking here to see, uh, to look for a question that we've had voted up um, as a topic of interest that we've not yet addressed. Um, and I'm just taking a moment here to see. Perhaps you could summarize for us then the breadth of nat or nature based solutions that could be implemented. So we know kind of alternating some of the logging impacts and replanting the trees, but can you summarize for us again those nature based solutions kind of across the watershed scale and keeping in mind the kinds of spatial and temporal variation you've spoken about that would help move us towards mitigating flood risk and impacts in our mountain systems in British Columbia. Well retain as much forest cover as possible, especially the younger trees. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, um, change the way we actually log and move uh, away, abandon basically clear cut logging. Um, restore the wetlands, the, the bogs, the marshes, the floodplains, right? All of these become handy during the larger events. And um, and we need to make sure when designing bridges and culverts, and even raising the dikes or setting them back, we want to make sure to keep in mind that any of these structures could actually be failing 
as a result of not a flood event coming in with a di with with a, with a runoff larger than the design capacity, but it could fail geomorphically as a result of lower than the capacity floods that is actually becoming way more frequent as a result of all kinds of disturbances. Fantastic. So I'm gathering a kind of as a summary from what you've talked about, and you mentioned partway through the presentation that that um, climate change, although it's impacting the types of floods that we're experiencing in British Columbia and is a major contributing factor, perhaps exacerbating some of these components, that also our land management and how we um, how we're managing these um, our ecosystems, our forests and other um, ecosystem types is really critical for finding our solutions and thinking outside of the box is going to be a really critical final step as we move forward um, to try to resolve the con or to, to resolve um, the flood risk and to mitigate against it um, into the future. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, just make sure you do not ask me a question. That, yeah, uh, sorry. No, I'm just I'm trying to summarize a, a key point. And I, I, you had mentioned, uh, Eunice, partway through your presentation that although climate change is an important factor and a contributing factor, it gets scapegoated a little bit. You know, we blame things on climate change when, in fact, land management and vegetation management is equally, if not, um, is equally important. And so I wanted to make sure, is that a take home message? you like our audience or to share with well, the audience I, today? I am, I am actually baffled uh, by the fact that um, most out there are silent about the role of forest and mitigating floods. And um, I have my theories as to why that is the case. Uh, but again, I am convinced, not just because of my work, but because of work of others as well, that the forest cover has a, is, a, is the most powerful natural resource for protecting us against future flood risk. Well, thank you. I think that sounds like um, a fantastic closing thought. Is there any last comments that you'd like to make um, to uh, a last thought for our audience to think about um, as we come to an end here? Well, I'm sharing the screen. Do you see my screen? We can see your screen. Thank you very much. Um, just a very quick thought in here. My, um, the theme of my presentation and the title of my presentation has been inspired and is in the, in the spirit of a 1982 quote by the godfather of forest hydrology, John D. Hewlett. And he stated, Hydrologists have understandably been confused by the difficulties inherent in describing the nature and frequency of floods to laymen who are up to have little patience with probability statements. But among ourselves, he's speaking now to his colleagues in the science community, but among ourselves, we must drop back to rigorous language in order to discuss and trade information about land use causes and flood effects. Hewlett in 1982 have pointed out to the entire forest hydrology community that the relation between the forest and floods can only be investigated within the probabilistic frame, framework. And so stop ta taking as an excuse the inability of the public not to be able to understand probability. I came to the conclusion that the public actually understand better the, the probabilistic framework and extremes. And I give you an example. No one will go and sue the government or the forest industry if that person from the public was experiencing only one flood event immediately after logging. But if that flood event keeps on happening again and again since the logging, that means now the floods are becoming more frequent. And that's the only reason why someone from the public will step forward and sue the forest industry. Therefore, I think the public better understand, right, the, the probabilistic nature of floods, right? The laws of nature are probabilistic, but particularly extremes. And this should become as a new surprise to anyone. But the fact remains, forest hydrology in this province has been conducted outside that framework. 
Well, on that note, thank you, Eunice. That's given us some really important um, points to think about. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us this afternoon and the importance and implication of them. Um, and I'm going to pass things over now to Rob to share some closing remarks this afternoon. Thank you, Laurie, just very briefly. So thanks, thanks, Laurie, for expertly moderating today's event. Um, and, and Eunice, mon ami, uh, thank you for sharing your, your passion and expertise and, and willingness to uh, walk away from engineering solutions. Very interesting indeed. Um, and I want to thank you for, for walking us through the, the incredibly complicated world of, of forced hydrology and, and this new attribution science, the science of extremes. Um, in a really lucid and understandable manner. Um, and in so doing, reinforcing the, the incredibly important role that, that forests play in ensuring the well-being of, of our planet and our, our communities. And in this case, the role that forests cover and forest practices can play in addressing the increasingly urgent need to mitigate flood risks. So thank you very much, Eunice. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers. Um, I've, I've been following the, the dialogue um, our, from our UBC community and friends. So thank you for joining us today and, and for engaging in a really interesting discussion and with your thought-provoking questions on Slido. If you're interested in learning more about Eunice's work or Lori's work um, or the Faculty of Forestry more broadly, just feel free to visit our website at, at www.forestry.ubc.ca. And if you would like to revisit this conversation that we had today um, or share it with others, a, a video from the virtual program will be made available um, at the very same website. Uh, the URL um, is currently showing on the screen and it's also in the chat, I believe. Um, so with that, um, I'll call this uh, event to a close. We wish everyone well as, as, as you head into the summer season, stay safe. And thanks again for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.